Yeah, welcome back to Afia TV News tonight and our conversation is centered around looting. Of course, Nema have beefed up security nationwide and denied attack on the Abuja warehouse. The National Emergency Management Agency, Nema, has debunked reports that its warehouse was looted by hoodlums in Abuja. Reports showed how hoodlums raided some warehouses in the nation's capital on Sunday morning. However, some sections of the media had reported that one of the affected warehouses belonged to Nema. Also, in a, in a statement, Nema um, by Manzo Ezekiel, its spokesperson, dismissed the report. And according to the agency, measures to safeguard its facilities nationwide have been put in place. The statement reads, and I quote, The attention of the National Emergency Management Agency, Nema, has been drawn to media reports on Sunday, alleging that the agency's warehouse was looted by some hoodlums in Abuja. This is to clarify that the looted warehouse does not belong to Nema, However, the agency sympathizes with owners of the looted facility, unquote. Joining me now to discuss this further is Dr. Chikezia Obasi, Secretary, Guild of Public Affairs Analyst of Nigeria, Enugu State Branch. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the show. Good evening, amazing grace. It's good to see you. Thank you. Well, in a very typical way of government and their agencies and governments, there's always um, the quick defense and face saving mechanism that goes on, maybe not to give an impression. Um, Nema, this time, I'm speaking about that they can't be looted or that their security is too tight to be weakened. So, why is there always this quick defense? And what are your thoughts on the incidents of looting? I mean, which um, which private individual would own that amount of grains that we saw people looting on Sunday and and there there? Um, first, it's um, for me, it's it's um, it's disheartening to see that Nigerians in their thousands, you know, troop to take bags of beans, you know, bags of cereals that one may not be able to carry on a good day. And we saw them carry them, and, you know, and then we are running with those bags. And as if they were just carrying um, a loaf of bread, you know. And it's disheartening that uh, the leadership of the federal government of Nigeria we we'll look at that instead of coming out from so, with sober reflection, they call them, you know, um, that they are looters. Um, it's unfortunate, yes, in this case, when you take an item that does not belong to you, mm. you could be said to have uh, looted those items. But I think uh, it's more worrisome, you know, to begin to see that, that denial from the federal government because the US reality today is that Nigerians are hungry, um, Nigerians are actually handling, looking for food to eat. <laughs> Uh, Nigeria has not gotten it this terrible, you know. Um, even if those warehouses um, did not belong to the federal government first, I think uh, it's disheartening and more ins instructive to note that Nigerians across the federation are asking for food, you know. We've seen uh, vehicles, uh, trucks of vehicles, drains that were actually stopped, uh, you know, vandalized, taken by people. We've heard some from communities in some parts of the country have been asking the you know, trucks before passing through the country to drop some grains. And uh, it's becoming a difficult one because whether they are private or individual, it's actually signifying one thing, that there's hunger in the town. Um, I, I wasn't comfortable when I noted that uh, Nema denied that that was not their, their you know, their, their storage facility. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to join issues with Nema, but I felt that Nema should have actually made it clearer or security agency would have said, this is the owner of the of the storage house. So we actually know who owned it. And if that's somebody's business, I mean, it means that there is no proper protection for such a person's business. However, I must tell you that uh, whether we would like it or not, the message is clearly sent that Nigerians are hungry and it will be wrong to begin to look at uh, those the, the act that was committed in terms of um, taking away the, the items. But it would have been better if people begin to look at these items from the fact that Nigerians are asking the government to provide relief to the hunger in the, in the land. I think that should be the message, and not necessarily that uh, looters have taken items that do not belong to them. Right, and the food crisis is becoming worse by the day. And of course, even with the restoration of electricity to Niger, whom we cut off because of the um, coup, do you think that there are secret talks at the moment to ensure food supply from that region? Since we know that Niger is very instrumental to some of our food supply, now how can we hobnob with the military there to come to our rescue? Um, you know, we, 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 partly, let me explain a little bit. It's not that food is not there. 
because but i think the problem is more the purchasing power for example a bag of locally produced rice sells between depending on part, the part of nigeria you are and where you are actually purchasing between 50 and 75,000 naira. Yeah, we, we, we can say there's food, but there's also reduction in production because of the insecurity of no, people I no longer I'm, going we're to gonna, We're coming to that. Yeah. Uh, what actually caused this particular crisis is that people do not have enough purchasing power. You know, in January, look at inflation rate hitting 30%, 29% plus. Uh, in January, it may, yeah, for people who actually had some money, the bag of rice was sold for less than 30,000 naira, and less than 38,000 naira. 40. Today, that same bag of rice is selling for 60 to 65,000, depending on the location where you're in Nigeria. Now, the same are applicable to Gary and the other food items. But the purchasing power had not increased. So it means that if you go to the market, you might not end up buying just a little bit above half of what your money could have bought for you in January this year. So it makes it difficult for people to, you know, to have those food to them. So the later you have, the monetary amount of money you have, your stomach has not decreased, number of days has not decreased, hours have not decreased. It's clear that your money cannot take you, you know, sell it to the market. That's number one. The number two is coming to what you're talking about insecurity. Incidentally, this is our first time, you know, um, we've not really gotten, that's where even my worry, we've not even gotten to us what in the, our people used to call organic, you know, during the planting season when food is not there. And we're actually scrambling to eat up everything right now. It simply means that either there is less cultivation, which is a result of insecurity, poor government, uh, abandonment of governance at local level, which is more instrumental than even insecurity, um, to worsening food crisis. And then, government at all levels not looking into the future to look at how the potentials of Nigeria increasing the net, 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 net uh, harvest. Um, a situation where we have a, a, a good um, population growth rate of above 3 percent and our economic growth rate is staggering between one and three percent i think it's not doing well for us so i have found that over the years government should have actually looked in to see how we deliberately push people into going going into cultivation and agriculture bearing in mind one that the first um uh, hierarchy of needs we have a maslow's hierarchy of needs is food clothing and shelter so if you cannot provide those physiological things like food what again are you trying to do as a nation? Second stage is security. So these two states, the government has failed, and both of them is rocking the system now. So I felt that it's a combination of issues that are actually leading to what we are having today. And government need not to deny. Government need to come, you know, plain with the reality on ground to see how they should tackle all the issues. Otherwise, I can tell you, this is actually getting, uh, 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 gradually, it's getting beyond what we could actually come to. Right. In the last week, so of course, we saw the bread makers were threatening to shut down, and which is as a result of shortage of wheat supply. And this is also a resultant of the war in Ukraine. And I remember very well during President Jonathan's government when he proposed that we start the cassava floor for bread. And since he was taking waivers of importation of wheat. Now, what do you think of this? Is it something we should revisit just as we're contemplating the revisit of Osunray's report? You see, the, this government, I must tell you, had a policy somersault. You know, um, when the government came, I remember I listened to the CBM boss who was trying to say that uh, the, the restriction on Forex on some items in Nigeria have been actually is over. His reason being that you can source your dollar from outside and then or from any source and get to, and get those importations. So you don't need to have CBN but uh, restricted. But I felt that was a wrong policy. That was a wrong statement because some of every country has a way of trying to, you know, allow the local inv investors or local producers to, to survive. Rice, um, rice uh, you know, restriction on forex and rice was a little bit a good a good business for us because if you look at it. Over the past three, four years, would have would have actually gained a lot. Now, wheat can be cultivated in the environment, the same as cassava could have been. So I expected that uh, this government should have actually looked at the gains we gained from rice to improve on other areas. You know, we could have actually used alternatives in economics. What we don't have, we look for alternatives. I remember growing up, I thought that St. Louis sugar was the only sugar on earth. You know, not until more recently, about five, six years ago, I began to see Dago, Dogan sugar. And some other locally produced. And today, I do not see St. Louis, you know, 
not as you know as rampant as used to as I used to say before. Now it means that the government that Nigeria had got an alternative. And that's what we would actually expected. That what government should have been doing is to look into agriculture after that was actually what took India out majorly out of poverty. So we look at into agriculture, see how we could actually put more incentive, look at alternative, try other mechanisms. Deliberate efforts should have been made by government to try other things that would have helped us out of the quagmire. I believe that importation is not the solution to it because we remember this type of crisis, we had it in 1983, you know, uh, 1980s and 1983 when we had austerity measure, we resorted to importation of food. Remember, just about 10, 15 years earlier, we were a net exporter of some of these products, including rice. Um, so we, if, if, if we rely on importation temporarily, I don't think that will, be, that will be fine. But I think the country should begin to leverage on items that you just have about three, three months, six months turn around, and you could actually leverage on those and provide alternative. Use the opportunity you could actually gain from now to see how do we get into real agriculture and then see how we can actually push our people back to production. Mm. All right, so what, what would be your recommendations for the crisis that we find ourselves now? Possibly the resultant factor from the policies of the government. So what are the things that would readily come to your mind as recommendations? First, I must say that um, the president is, is drag, food dragging. Nigeria can get it right without local government autonomy. Nigeria cannot get it right without local government functioning. If you like, let's dance from now to tomorrow. The closest um, leadership of Nigeria uh, of Nigerians is at the local government level. You know, if you want to take uh, insecurity, for example, if you if you have a legislation today that says that every local government should be autonomous and INEC should conduct election and local government chairman must reside within the locality where I mean the insecurity is sorted out. And I can tell you that small and medium scale enterprises will spring up, including like dairy processing and. Uh, 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 wood processing and, and all those agricultural produce, they should actually come up. And you see that these issues within the next six months to one year will not, will not be a, a problem. And I will now move on to how we process these items to, you know. So for me, policy guidelines, the first is not to stand at that national level and continue handling, handling things as handout. Federal government does not have governance at the local level. What the, the, the closest to government at local level is local government system. And I feel Policy-wise, you must strengthen local government system, and then give local government system the charge, you know, to take carry out its function: primary education, primary health care, real, real road security, environmental, um, environmental health, and the agriculture, which could actually take up as much as fifty to sixty percent of our Nigerians, you know, out of uh, uh, to be employed and become more productive than we have today. So I would say. Yes, somebody could tell you a meal ticket and so on, but they will all be, you know, they'll still go into the hands of a few who would actually, you know, convert it to their personal goods. So I think the straightforward policy, talk about that. The second policy is putting the state governors to start doing the, the right thing. I must commend them. So a few state governors, I must commend Lagos state government, you know, um, they've seen some policies they wrote that like having a market where they could actually um, make sure that there's a selling, you know, price of sales of goods and commodities, trying as much as they could to reduce the price of uh, immortal rice. Many of the states will have, um, have rice, you know, the rice they produce. Um, the, the state government can actually do that and then try to, as much as they could to use uh, one person per item, you know, to, to, buy, to buy the rice. And then transport fare being reduced, you know, so that people could have some purchasing power in their hands. Um, Lagos state government actually tried as much as he could to say that civil servants could equally work at home and then reduce the number of work days to three days. And then begin to look at how to offset people's hospital bills and so on. I think government should be able to do those so as to put more money in the hands of people. And I feel that's where the state government could actually come, you know, to, to see how they could put some incentives so that Nigerians wouldn't actually be burnt off. And then uh, finally, I must say that this denial issue is not the right thing. I think the federal government should come out openly to acknowledge that we have a crisis and everybody needed to come on board rather than denying that we do not have any crisis in hand. Okay, so let me ask your thoughts because you've mentioned um, part of the recommendations. You're mentioning um, strengthening the local government and of course giving autonomy to local government. Um, it sort of seems like um, when you talk about when people want to campaign for government offices, they, they like to use the word restructuring. And then when they get into the office, they're very scared to do that. Well, um, 
the Nobel laureate Professor Shoyinka mentioned something on that last week. And of course, he's saying that there's no politician who has talked about restructuring that has gone in and fulfilled it. And speaking about, you know, describing how the problems are with Nigerian at the moment and saying at the base of the development of Nigeria should be the very thought of restructuring. And we saw President Tinubu sharing some words on restructuring and saying, oh, well, um, he's trying to lay the foundation and restructuring is not easy. But this is contrary to what he said whilst he was campaigning. So why do you think that they're so scared? You know, nobody wants to mention it. And even if it comes up at the House, the Senate, it's, it's, always, it's almost like a bill that's thrown out the door. So what's making them so scared of restructuring? Is this, I mean, taking more, away power from the center and, you know, decentralizing the power so Nigerians can have a hold of their country? Two reasons. One is um, the absolute corruption at the, at the, at the center both at the federal and the state level. Um, because if you really look at it, it's not just the president that is not interested. The state governors who have a lot of um, their hands chopped into the local government autonomy actually enjoys the Lazard, you know, whatever they're doing. So deep into it of, um, of not allowing it is absolute corruption and lack of patriotism. And then second, on the second flip side is um, the duality of the populace. We've not actually given a, a, a real push. I must tell you that. The, I think Nigerians are not really understanding the concept of restructuring. Many of us do not understand that uh, for a lot of things we need the federal government to give to us. Uh, it's in the hands of the local government areas. You know. And that we allow, deliberately allow the state government and local government area to, to channel all our problems to the federal, which is, which, uh, you know, which, is, which is wrong. So I think these two factors um, the, the people at the national level understand this are ignorant and they are absolutely corrupt. And that I mean at the center, they are absolutely corrupt. They do not want to do it. But I must commend the efforts of some of our legislators who are coming, you know, the 60 of them. They were talking about um, restructuring the system. But by the way, restructuring here is let's recalibrate the system. So we can actually, it means a whole lot to different people. Uh, yeah, for some people, it means create more states. For some other people, it means devolve more power you know, to, this, to the periphery, you know, local government area and the state. For some other persons, it's resource control. But one thing is clear, whatever we are doing today is no longer working. You know, we had a better growing system in 1960s to 1970s than what we had from 1979 when we started practicing this current style of government. So I think we needed to uh, retrieve whatever we are doing, we needed to watch it, we needed to go back and then um, actually recalibrate our system. And at the bottom of it is how do we select our leaders? It's, it's expensive, it's cumbersome. The camera system of governance may not be the best for us. This current presidential system looks more expensive, it looks more authoritarian, you know, more humongous power at the center, and people living affluent life at the expense of you know the poor Nigerians. So we could actually begin to look at something that is less expensive, less attractive to you know, more service delivery oriented. And why, why we would concentrate more energy in making our periphery, the special local government system and the state to have a more economic power. And there's no reason why we should place people to have immunity clause, you know, in a criminal immunity clause. That's not acceptable as far as I'm concerned. Because it actually allows people to commit all manner of crimes, you know, and they are being, being leaders, you know, waiting, that, uh, waiting for eight years to pass so they can actually live. So I believe that at the back, background, the people that are leading us haven't gotten enough push from us, and then they actually look at that, and they feel they, they can actually maneuver the system because they, their part is not actually patriotic. The way that we get a patriotic leader, I believe really maintain that restructuring is the will of the president. All you needed to do is to explain to Nigerians, explain to the legislators, explain to the state governors the benefit of this. In the long run, that everybody has stands to benefit. What does this stand to give the northern person? That today, he can no longer go to his farm to cultivate. The cattle, cattle rustlers are rustling their cattle, while local government chairmen in, their, in, in the north all live in the state capital, only to share local government allocation once it comes. So local government only functions maybe one or twice in a month, and everybody goes home. The average poor man in the north is not enjoying it. How does it solve the problem? That a local government area like Congo doesn't have a bank, and yet we have local government there. 
uh, local men that has been there for how many for how many decades and nobody is living there. We have quarters, workers' quarters, and those are the buildings that were constructed in the 60s and 70s. No innovation, no academic, no economic activities going on there. No new improved ideas. And what does it profit to put to see? Now the primary school they passed through in the 1970s, built by the community or the, can, the council, local government council then, is still lying that way, simply because the local government chairman is, is, is not deciding that, doesn't understand what's going on. So I feel, by the time the president begins to enumerate the benefit all of us are going to enjoy, you know, I think everybody will come to understand uh, that we need to allow the system to work. And then thereafter, we we'll gain more, we we'll gain better with the system working. Because I always tell people, if we don't, if we do not have a well functioning um, health system, you can't manage any emergency abroad. That's the truth. We, we must be stabilized in the country during which we must have exceeded six hours, which is almost the timeline for virtually almost emer all emergencies to be handled. Because if you have an emergency, you can be airlifted until you are stabilized. So what does it benefit us that you buy a four, four, four six-cylinder engine jeep, where, you know, jumping every every gallop? Because you have the money, you have the opportunity. Why don't you put the roads in order? You can use 1.1 liter engine. You still drive comfortably, drive in a secure environment without finding a place to run away at the end of your tenure. So I think if we have patriotic leaders that should be explained to Nigerians, this is why we need to restructure. This is why we all need to put our hands on deck. And we'll put a timeline, even if it's economic resource control or whatever, we we'll put a timeline, maybe over 20, 30 years, each state should be asked, should be uh, um, you know helped in your area of uh, uh, competitive advantage. You produce better. You form economic blocks you know along the geopolitical zones. In the northwest, what can you produce? What can federal government do between now and the next ten years to encourage maximum output in your area? The northeast, the northwest, all those geopolitical zones. How do we handle this? I'll begin to move gradually. Have a policy that will give us a direction of where we are going. And unlike what we are doing today. People just get into government and they, you know, lose whatever they feel, and they go. Is it not? Is it not horrendous to hear that a, a, a minister, I think a former humanitarian minister, he says they've got collected about thirty billion from the person. What does the person do with thirty billion? Is it not looking like a psychiatric idea? How would I do with the money? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Any money that is stashed in the bank that does not turn into productivity is just tissue paper. And it doesn't make sense. When you die, you don't have anything to do. So we need to begin to re-engineer that people should begin to see money as an instrument of creating and uh, solving problems in, the, uh, in society. Not instrument of passion. After you're not doing anything with this money. And virtually you're going to do. So this is the type of orientation I feel we have lacked at the center. People still see money as they could buy bags, watches and so on, use luxury items, rather than using it to create wealth and make the a better life for the next generation, you know. And when we have leaders that think about that, they will understand that restructuring is the next way to go. And by the way, many of us do not really understand that, you know, by the time we finish leadership, we are still going to go back to the society. I will still continue shouting bad roads and electricity, poor, poor water supply, poor health institution, and so on. So I don't think it's, um, it's a difficult one, only that we do not really have patriotic leaders who are interested in the genuineness of Nigeria. Well said and well shared. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, Dr. Chikeze Obasi, Secretary, Guild of Public Affairs, Analyst of Nigeria, Enugu State Branch. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.